This lovely manhua is titled, I'm Here to Destroy. If you love stories like this, please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you'll never miss the next episode. Rosalita walks majestically towards a guard standing at the entrance, greeting him friendly. He asks if she has an invitation, but she smiles, saying she forgot that she was supposed to bring one. It slipped her mind. Sure, liar. You and I know she doesn't have one? With her arms folded, Rosalita tries to convince the guard, explaining that she was told to just say the name Sepak, and she would be allowed inside as she met him on the way. She assures him, even suggesting he can ask Sepak when he returns. The guard chuckles, acknowledging that he can see she's a guest and apologizes for even asking. He then hands her a mask. Oops, he actually fell for her words. Their security is sure not tight at all. Rosalita takes the mask and covers her face. The guard reminds her to bring an invitation next time, to which she smirks and says she will. She thinks to herself, that goes for them too. Well, of course, there won't actually be a next time. She's only here to save Chloe, after all. Upon entering, the man leads the way down a long corridor that resembles a dungeon lined with countless cells. It's evident they are involved in slave trading, really a shocking discovery. Rosalita cautiously scans her surroundings, searching for any sign of Chloe. Suddenly, her attention is drawn to a door, sparking her curiosity about what lies behind it. Immediately, the guard obstructs her view, informing her that the area is off-limits and unauthorized for guests. She asks why he blocked her view, as she wasn't planning on going there. The guard explains that it's for her safety. She smiles to herself, thinking, is that so? Hmm, I bet she'll go there. No matter how risky it is, I love your determination, Alaria. The guard tells her to follow him as the event is about to start. However, Rosalita interrupts, saying that it's fine and he doesn't need to stress himself any further as she has found her destination. The guard, confused, wonders what she means. Before he can react, she smacks him on the head, causing him to groan in pain and fall unconscious. She grins, pleased with her handiwork. I doubt that was an ordinary smack. She must have knocked him out with her powers. What do you think? Feeling a sense of pride, Rosalita examines her hand and remarks that she has successfully dealt with one of the guards, glad that she's managed to take care of at least one potential obstacle, but then, dearies, don't you think there will be more of them? Can she actually handle them all by herself? As Rosalita walked fearlessly towards the door, she confidently stated that catching the other guard wouldn't be difficult. She would only need to land a single hit to defeat him, despite his apparent skills. Her main objective now is to save Chloe and return safely. Just as she was absorbed in her thoughts while making her way to the door, someone abruptly grabbed her, roughly turning her around and causing her pain. The person who grabbed Rosalita was also in disguise and wearing a mask, which suggested that she was a guest like Rosalita had pretended to be. Rosalita realized the person might be a woman. The person questioned Rosalita's presence and asked about her maid, doubting that the Derman family had sent her directly to this location. Addressing Rosalita as a young lady, the woman's familiarity with the Derman family left Rosalita surprised. Just like anyone else would wonder, how did he know she was from a German household? With a swift motion, Rosalita twisted the person's wrist and shoved it away, her thoughts racing with the possibility that he might know about her connection to Rosalita. The man, shocked by Rosalita's unexpected strength, muttered under his breath, questioning the extent of her power. The force behind the push was far from ordinary. As the man's mask fell off, Rosalita was taken aback to discover that the person she thought was a woman was actually a man, donning a wig as part of his disguise. Her shock was evident on her face. She hesitated before finally speaking up. She pointed at him and asked if he preferred to wear feminine clothing. The man removed the wig and explained that he was merely in disguise. The handsome young man flipped his yellow hair, explaining that it was all a ruse to confuse people and hide his true identity. He questioned her understanding of the basic principles of disguise. Well, I doubt she does, because anyone can easily tell who she is, even with her disguise. Don't you think so, too? Rosalita found herself wondering about the identity of this mysterious man. Glancing at her, he remarked that he hadn't expected her to be so strong. Rosalita laughed out loud, exclaiming that she'd always been strong since childhood. The man looked at his wrists, commenting on her impressive swordsmanship that had left his wrists tingling. Rosalita, realizing that he was likely a skilled swordsman, wondered what he was doing there and why he was putting on an act. 
The man's voice grew fierce as he questioned her presence in that place and why a young lady like her was wandering around alone. She quickly turned away, concealing her lying face and smiling nervously. She stuttered that she had been taking a walk and had somehow gotten lost. With an unbelievable glare, he questioned if she truly expected him to believe her story. She insisted it was the truth, adding that she had recently lost her memories. Suddenly, she boldly pointed at him and questioned his identity, asking why he seemed to know her and if he was her friend. What was his name? He stood silently with folded arms, his face stony and unreadable. Finally, he relented and introduced himself as Thomas, though Rosalita suspected it was a lie. She told him he didn't need to share anything if he didn't want to. However, he then asked if she planned to keep her reasons for being there a secret. Since they both appeared to be suspicious characters, he suggested they share their motives openly. Deciding to confide in him, Rosalita explained that her personal maid, Chloe, had been kidnapped and was being held captive in this place. Thomas questioned her decision to search for Chloe alone, his gaze filled with disbelief. Exactly like who does that? Why'd she just embark on a rescue mission on her own? What if something bad happens to her? Risky, right? His question silenced Rosalita, and he admitted to himself that her story sounded suspicious, even to him. He asked why she didn't run back to the Marquis and seek help if that were truly the case. Suddenly, a sound came through the electronic device in his ear, and someone addressed him as Your Highness, inquiring about the situation. He turned away, responding that it was just a minor nuisance. He then informed them about the kidnapped maid from the Derman household and suggested they help find her. Rosalita, shocked by his willingness to assist, stared at him in disbelief, muttering that he actually intended to help her. He relayed Chloe's name to the informant and turned to Rosalita for confirmation of her age. Rosalita informed him that Chloe was around 17, 18 years old. Well, baby girl, I don't think you'll need that. You have natural strength already, right? He stared at her, surprised by her revelation, as she continued to explain that she had checked the warehouse earlier when they passed by. Confused by her statement, he listened as she suddenly shouted that she had found something. To his astonishment, Rosalita effortlessly lifted a massive hammer, larger than herself, onto her shoulders, grinning as she asked for his opinion. He hesitated before responding that they weren't going on a picnic, which left Rosalita looking lame. He turned and gestured for her to follow him. As they walked past the cells, the man seemingly ignored the voices pleading for help. However, one boy managed to grab Rosalita's clothing, addressing her as sister and begging her to set them free. She looked at the boy, her gaze filled with pity as she listened to his desperate plea. Feeling sympathy for the boy, Rosalita was reminded of her own past struggles when she had been isolated and pleaded for freedom. She couldn't ignore the boy's plight and expressed disgust toward the people who had imprisoned them. Observing her reaction, the man muttered to himself that she appeared shocked by the situation. He then communicated with someone through his earpiece, stating that they were leaving because they hadn't found what they were searching for. Upon hearing this, Rosalita turned to him in shock and asked if they were really going to leave just like that. He replied that indeed they were, explaining that her maid would trust his subordinate and they would depart together. Rosalita, feeling anxious, asked about the fate of those currently trapped. The man fell silent, lost in his thoughts. The man remained silent, lost in thought as the captives begged to be untied, pleading for them not to be abandoned. Their desperate cries echoed through the air, expressing their fear of becoming slaves. Surrounded by the chaos, the man appeared uncertain about how to proceed, Rosalita, overcome with sadness, declared that she couldn't bring herself to leave the captives in such a state. She questioned how he could even consider leaving after witnessing their suffering, calling the idea absurd. Rosalita told him to go alone, assuring him that she could handle the situation by herself. As she turned to leave, he grabbed her hand and pulled her back toward him. Stunned, Rosalita found her hands resting on his shoulders, unable to process the swiftness of his actions. She couldn't help but wonder how a human could possess such strength, angry that she had to question him. What are you doing? He shot her a fierce look with his eyes full of concern, making it clear that he wasn't happy with her question. He then said, My lady, I don't know about your confidence. He then challenged her, asking if she really thought she was strong enough to handle them the situation on the ground. She snapped back in frustration, saying, Then enough with that. Oops, well, I guess she's fed up. 
He continued asking if she really thought they were the only slave traders in the Rundle Empire, stating that their roots were wider and deeper than she realized. Rosalita asked if he truly believed that, to which he responded that even if they were to clean up the place, nothing would change. He began to explain that the Empire didn't ignore things without cause, but she cut him off, declaring, I have such grand aspirations. Rosalita looked sad, her eyes welling up with tears as she said that all she had wanted to do was save Chloe. Recalling her own experiences being trapped in the isolation room, she remembered how all the main characters were preoccupied with their plays and musicals, willfully ignoring the malicious intent they saw around them. She had always been envious of those who could ignore suffering, for she could never witness someone in distress without offering a helping hand. Everything happening now seemed to echo her past experiences. Too bad. She's literally re-watching her past pain again. He watched as she lowered her head and called out, Lady? Just then, they both heard a voice say, Your Majesty, are the guards headed this way? The man turned in the direction of the voice, his gaze sharp. Rosalita exclaimed, I heard a voice coming from over here. Suddenly, they discovered a door which appeared to be a passage out of this place. Finally, a chance to escape their captivity, they both stared at the door. He turned to Rosalita and told her that their pursuers had noticed them. He instructed her to head back, assuring her that he would take care of the situation from there. He urged her to go outside, where his men would be waiting for her. Rosalita, concerned, said, It's dangerous. Don't you want to back off? Visibly annoyed, he instructed her to look at him and asked if she thinks this is something she can do alone. Staring back at him, Rosalita replied confidently that you have to try and find out. Wow, her confidence level is high. I hope she doesn't mess it up, though. He exerted all his strength to try breaking free, but it seemed ineffective, so he muttered in frustration that it was an iron cage. Turning to him, she said that he only needed to open it. Meanwhile, the men were discussing the Baron's interest in a particular item when suddenly an explosion occurred, causing widespread panic. Ouch! That's scary! Rosalita broke in with the hammer while her sidekick watched her take action. She glanced at him, wondering why he seemed uninterested and what could be wrong with him. One of the guards spotted Rosalita and her sidekick walking in like Power Rangers. He immediately spoke into the emergency control device in his hand, shouting, Intruders in Area B3, requesting immediate support. Before he could finish, Rosalita struck him with a kick that lifted him up and threw him to the ground. Her sidekick watched her dazedly as she took complete control, appearing to have fun in the process. He thought to himself that she was destroying everything as if it were her own house. Oh yeah, Rosalita is taking this rescue mission incredibly serious, don't you think? Ignoring his concerns, Rosalita charged forward, causing chaos and destruction throughout the area. She insisted that he would take responsibility for the consequences of their actions and not make a fuss. Although taken aback by her reckless approach, he replied that he had already accepted the responsibility for their mission, but hadn't anticipated the extent of the destruction she would unleash. A group of men approached from behind, one of them scolding their comrades for their incompetence in handling just two intruders. He furiously ordered them to apprehend Rosalita and her companion. The man shouted furiously, commanding the others to capture the intruders immediately. Rosalita, without hesitation, sprang into action and lifted her hammer high, preparing to land a powerful blow on the man's head. Her companion pulled the man away and questioned her actions, asking who the real villain was among them. Like seriously, he needs to ask her again. The man pleaded to be spared, admitting that he had given up hope when Rosalita was about to strike him. Meanwhile, Rosalita's sidekick Thomas received information through his earpiece that the Derman family's maid had been located, along with the princess's escort. Upon hearing the news, Rosalita inquired if there were any updates on Chloe's whereabouts. Her companion turned to her and informed her that Chloe's escort had also arrived to rescue her. He then glanced at Rosalita, approaching her, and commented that it seemed her subordinates were likely enduring significant challenges in their efforts to rescue Chloe. Rosalita felt a touch on her clothing, and, turning to see who it was, she found the young boy from earlier. She asked him if everything was all right. After a brief hesitation, the boy shared that there were more people being held captive in another part of the compound. Stunned by the boy's revelation, His Majesty turned around in shock, his expression making it clear that he was processing the news that more captives were present. Rosalita, seeking clarification, 
asked if the boy was saying that there were still others who had been captured. Suddenly, His Majesty, her sidekick, shouted a warning to Rosalita, alerting her to an imminent threat. He informed her that someone was approaching from behind, intending to strike her with a hammer. The boy watched in amazement as Rosalita took down the man with a single kick. As the man lay on the ground, Rosalita revealed that he had been faking unconsciousness, surprising both her and the boy. Turning to the boy, she asked for confirmation of his earlier statement about other captives. The boy was frightened by her presence, wondering how a girl could be so strong and intelligent. I guess that's what he must be thinking. The man and Rosalita listened intently as the boy mentioned a captured winged person. Rosalita, curious about the description, asked for clarification. Jens, the dragon-like beings who once challenged God, possessed steel-like wings that created powerful winds when flapped. With physical abilities surpassing those of most humans, it was hard to imagine these creatures being captured and imprisoned by humans. Really unbelievable, right? Leading the way, His Majesty considered the possibility, while Rosalita questioned the credibility of the boy's claim. The man replied that it wouldn't hurt to investigate further. They arrived at a wall, and His Majesty, sensing something beyond it, explained that magic power was being blocked. He slowly drew his sword, suggesting that they might have used magical means to create the barrier. His Majesty swung his sword at the wall, but it remained unharmed. Admiring the strong magic protecting it, he said that the slave traders had done an excellent job. Rosalita, with a mischievous grin, teased His Majesty, joking that even a skilled swordmaster like him couldn't get past the wall. Oops, funny, but she really got him. He glared at Rosalita and then smiled a little. He lifted his sword and told her to pay attention. He wants to prove her wrong by trying. With a powerful swing, he shattered the magical wall into blue shimmering pieces. Wow, he did it. Rosalita took a peek, and the man excitedly declared that he found it. Peering through the opening, they discovered a winged man, kneeling and chained. His majesty revealed that he was the spiritual leader of the Jens, known as Praman Four, and currently the only one of his kind with intact wings. Intact wings? Rosalita questioned as they observed the imprisoned man. Confused, she wondered if mental health didn't hold much importance. His majesty explained that on the contrary, it was extremely significant, especially for the well-being of the Jens race. He explained that the Jens race could even be reborn while still keeping their memories. As he approached the cell with his sword, Rosalita interrupted him, asking for clarification about the repeating cycle of events and the history between the Rodians and Jens. He glanced at her, questioning if she had truly lost her memories. If that were the case, he suggested that it might be more helpful for her to reread a fairy tale to better understand the relationship between the two groups. He further stated, that there wasn't a single person in Rodea who was unaware of the story, Rosalita, growing increasingly pissed, exclaimed, What? Did he really just say that to her, she wondered, questioning if he had been sarcastic in his response. The imprisoned man called out, declaring with pride that they would never understand whom they served, even in their wildest dreams. He proclaimed that their race had been forsaken by the gods. The elderly gent glared fiercely, proudly saying that his people would continuously be reborn, vowing to absolutely crush and devour the Rodians. He declared that they would subject the Rodians to an endless torment, one that would drive them to plead for the mercy of death. Imagine someone she came to save. Shouldn't he be begging right now to be freed? They must really hate the rodents, right? His Majesty questioned the imprisoned gent, asking if he truly believed they would allow his predictions to come to pass. His Majesty inquired, If you alone were to die, wouldn't that effectively end the lineage of the gents? Rosalita asked if he intended to kill him, and he replied, saying that's right. Although the gents are already self-destructing, if this individual perishes, they can advance that time a little. Praman was furious when he heard what his majesty said. He yelled angrily that the people of Rodea were nothing but worms, and they had no right to talk about the end of the gents' race. Praman warned that the Rodeans would feel the anger of the gods for what they had done. Hmm, that's odd. Wrath from the same gods he clearly said abandoned their race? He smirked and told Praman that it was strange for people who called themselves enemies of the gods to ask for the gods' help. He then asked angrily why he did not respect his own people or have any pride. Praman replied that his smile was only temporary. His majesty warned Praman that if they joined with the dragon, they would have to face the results of their actions. 
Praman then asked for mercy from the god of plants before looking into Rosalita's eyes and calling her by a different name, Alaria. Oh my, how did he know she's the god of plants? That's scary, you know, right? Alaria is shocked, thinking to herself, I beg your pardon. With a big smile, Praman explained that even the gods were afraid of Alaria and had locked her away. He believed that if Alaria and the dragon came down to the world, the gents would rule everything. His majesty was shocked and confused when asked if Praman was talking about the same Alaria, the god of plants. Rosalita became scared and shouted, No! Praman grinned and said that if they were killed, Alaria would put a curse on the person who did it. Rosalita was very confused in her mind and couldn't believe that she would ever team up with the gents to destroy Rodea. She thought to herself, there's no way that's true. Suddenly, she remembered when the gods, including Jupiter, were talking about making a big decision while she was locked in a room all by herself. They asked Jupiter when he would stop Alaria because they thought she was working with the gents to do something bad. Rosalita remembered that she used to ask herself what she could do when she was locked up all the time. She thought to herself that the truth didn't matter, and she was really tired of being trapped. Now in this new world, she was hearing the same things, even though she didn't know why she was there. It was making her angry. Rosalita walked closer to the cell, muttering to herself. She was upset because she kept hearing voices saying they had to kill her. His Majesty asked Rosalita what she was going to do, and she held onto the prison bars, thinking that she couldn't take it anymore. She needed answers and wanted someone to explain what was happening. Rosalita angrily pulled on the metal bars, frustrated and saying that Alaria was just a god of plants who only knew how to make plants and grass grow. She shouted, how could a god like that possibly destroy the world? That's absurd, right? But then one can tell. Praman asked Rosalita if she really thought the leaders of the groups would easily tell her the truth. He laughed and said that was silly and unbelievable. Suddenly, Praman lifted his hands that were chained together and quickly moved to where Rosalita was standing. He was very angry and grabbed her by the throat, squeezing tightly. He said that he was praying to God, which is disgusting. Rosalita struggled and made a groaning sound. Praman thanked her for making it easy for him to end her life. Rosalita grits and the king calls out to her, worried about what was happening. Rosalita thought to herself that her human body was so fragile and weak. Praman, still holding onto Rosalita's throat, turned to the king and told him that if he wanted to save Rosalita, he needed to hurry up and free him from the magic prison. Praman said that breaking through the magical barrier was easy for him, so getting out of the prison should be even easier. His majesty got angry and felt like he didn't have any other choice. He raised his sword and used his magic to hit the prison, which made Rosalita fall to the ground out of Praman's reach. Praman made an angry sound while Rosalita breathed a sigh of relief, feeling safer now that she was out of his reach. His majesty instructed her to stay put and not move from where she was. His majesty used his magical sword again to break the prison barrier and the chains holding Praman. Once freed, Praman quickly flew past them trying to escape, as his majesty was about to chase after him, Rosalita grabbed his arm and asked him to wait. She questioned if killing Praman so easily was the right choice, wondering what would happen next. Rosalita told him that she had so many questions she needed to ask Praman, and if he died now, she would never find the answers. Rosalita continued, explaining her need to understand why Ilaria, the god of plants, was seen as a symbol of destruction and why the gents considered her their god. His Majesty paused for a moment, glancing at the distance Praman had put between them, and asked Rosalita why she was so curious about Alaria being their god. He told her that it didn't seem like something she should be concerned about. As he turned to run after Praman, Rosalita asked him what he meant by that. He replied that it was because Alaria, the goddess, would never have joined forces with the gents. He looked back at Rosalita and confidently said, the goddess Mariah would never have joined hands with them. Oh wow, that's so touching, this man seems to know a lot. Who is he exactly? You're curious too, right? Rosalita stared at him, unable to find the words to respond. She asked him how he could be so certain that the goddess Ilaria would never join forces with the gent people. His majesty was about to continue his pursuit when he heard her question and he paused. He explained that the goddess was one of the eight gods who ruled over Rodea making it highly unlikely for someone in her position to easily betray the trust of her own people. Ah, finally, someone who understands her. Rosalita called out to his majesty, Thomas. 
He turned his attention back to her and asked if her neck was all right, which surprised her. Huh? My neck? She replied as she immediately reached for it, realizing she had almost been strangled. She assured him that she was fine, and then took out her mask, a small grin forming on her face, and said that only minor characters would die so easily because she considered herself the main character. Oh wow, her confidence is top notch. Speaking to herself, Rosalita mentioned that the body she currently possessed was not an easy one to handle. Suddenly she became worried when she remembered that there were marks on her neck from the attempted strangulation, and she wondered what she would say to the Marquis if they noticed. She knew that her family would not take the matter lightly, and she quickly covered her neck, catching the attention of His Majesty. Rosalita decided to set aside the concerns about the gents for the moment and focus on finding a way to deal with the marks on her neck while on board. She decided that once she returned home, she would have to wear dresses with high necklines to hide the evidence on her neck. His Majesty noticed Rosalita's actions and commented on her changing emotions, saying she gets angry and then laughs but can't seem to stay calm. He then received information from one of his trusted messengers, informing him that they had arrived outside and taken care of the situation. He invited them in to help clean up the mess inside. When asked if anything was wrong, His Majesty explained that there was much damage caused by Rosalita. His Majesty inquired about Sepak, but the informant replied that they hadn't found him yet. He advised them to search for Sepak quietly, mentioning a device using magic science located deep within the facility. Meanwhile, Rosalita approached His Majesty Thomas and said that if they found Sepak, they should break his legs on her behalf as punishment. His Majesty glanced at her with a facial expression. Oh, really? The king's informants asked him if everything was okay, and he turned away from Rosalita, telling them it was nothing, and asking them to inform him as soon as they found Sepak. Turning away, Rosalita expressed her desire to confront Sepak herself, but realized she couldn't face a slave trader in her current state. She admitted that she would need His Majesty's help. She glanced at Thomas, curious about his role in all this, and he explained that her maid was with an escort knight named Charles. Rosalita repeated the knight's name and Thomas added that they were waiting for her with a carriage sent by Benjamin Derman. Upon hearing this, Rosalita froze, processing the information and then suddenly shouted in surprise, What? Wait, how did Benjamin find her? Which means the family knows about this. As Rosalita left the building, she saw Chloe and Charles waiting outside, both of them in tears. So dramatic, well, they would have been in big trouble if her lady wasn't okay. Overwhelmed with relief, Chloe ran to Rosalita and embraced her tightly, almost knocking her to the ground. Chloe expressed how worried they had been when Rosalita disappeared from the hiding place where she was supposed to wait for them to find help. She explained that many people were searching for Rosalita at that moment. Rosalita apologized for causing them trouble, and Chloe, accepting her apology, urged her to get into the carriage so they could leave the area safely. Rosalita asked Chloe to wait for a moment and then turned to Thomas, who was occupied with his men. She called out to him, and when he asked why, she made a gesture to remind him not to forget to break Sepak's legs, as they had discussed earlier. Oh my! Like seriously? She's serious about those legs of Sepak. His Majesty? Thomas understood the intensity of her request from the look in her eyes, realizing she was serious about breaking both of Sepak's legs. Rosalita emphasized her point by holding up two fingers, indicating that she wanted both legs to be broken. Thomas couldn't help but laugh, noticing that Rosalita's friends were pushing her into the carriage, yet she was more focused on reminding him about breaking Sepak's legs. He grinned and assured her that he understood her request. Rosalita, however, still seemed skeptical and gave him a strange look, saying she didn't believe he truly understood. His Majesty Thomas watched as her carriage moved away, confident in her request. One of his men approached him, stating that they still hadn't found Sepak. Thomas instructed him to continue the search because he needed to capture Praman Fores and discover his plans. Shocked, the man asked Thomas if he meant the same Praman Fores they had been looking for, who had also been captured. Thomas confirmed that it was indeed the same person. To prove his point, Thomas threw an object at the man who caught it. The man asked what the object was, and Thomas revealed that it was Praman Fores's head, which sent chills down the man's spine, leaving him speechless. That's actually scary. His Majesty declared that capturing Praman Fores was just the first step, and they would need to take down their enemies one by one to restore peace in the empire. 
His Majesty paused for a moment and then suddenly burst into laughter. He commented that he hadn't known Princess Dermon had this side to her personality. Previously, she appeared to be quiet and reserved, often smiling silently. However, today he saw a different new side of her character. A lousy, funny, and annoying side, I guess. Thomas grinned, expressing his anticipation to see Princess Dermon again. His men who were watching were surprised to see him smile so much and started whispering among themselves. They wondered if he was smiling because he had killed Praman. Noticing their chatter, Thomas called out to them, addressing them as fellows. The men quickly reacted, rushing toward him and kneeling before him. Thomas then ordered them to prepare for their return to the Imperial Palace as soon as possible. Oh my, who is this man? Is he the Emperor or Crown Prince? The men bowed, accepting his command, and hailed him as their crown prince. Rosalita was right. The name Thomas was a lie. Oops, so he lied about his name. On the continent of Rodea, Fuente Rendolin, the crown prince of the Rundle Empire, was a man with yellow hair and a great physique. He glared, saying it's been a long time and he's going back with a gift. Iona, the pink-haired goddess of wine, had pink ribbons adorning her hands. Shouting, Jupiter questioned Iona, the god of wine, about her actions and why she didn't make a move until Ilaria, the goddess of plants, escaped. Jupiter pointed out that Iona knew how things would unfold, yet she remained silent. Jupiter called Iona by her name, telling her to summon the other gods immediately so they could begin a meeting to discuss Ilaria's situation immediately. The gods assembled before Jupiter inquiring about the reason they had been called upon. They asked if he had figured out his thoughts regarding Ilaria, whom they referred to as that trash. Jupiter, who had his back turned to them, slowly turned around, staring at them in silence. The gods eagerly awaited a wise response from him this time. Angie, the god of water, asked if they would be able to catch Ilaria, suggesting that even if she ran away, she couldn't have gone far. Sienna, the god of Earth, replied that even a god could not escape the constraints of Rodea. Sienna further stated that if Ilaria had been that resourceful, she would have already found a suitable body to hide in. One of the gods, Tisha, the god of justice, angrily spoke up, asking why they addressed Ilaria in such a mean manner and insisted on using her name. All the other gods turned to look at Tisha as she continued, Tisha questioned why those who were born gods, claiming to be sublime and innocent souls, would scramble to become ugly in front of one person. With a fierce expression, Tisha asked if they were scared enough to abandon their godly authority and questioned if this was a sign of the fall of Rita. Tisha, in her defense of Alaria, confronted the other gods for their behavior and treatment of their fellow deity. The other gods ranted, questioning what Tisha had just said, while a few others applauded her for her righteousness. Iona spoke up, stating that Tisha was the only one in Rita who sided with Ilaria, whom Iona still referred to as that trash. Iona continued, explaining that in order to seal the dragon, they had broken the sacred rules of Rita, and the consequences is more disastrous than they had expected. In Rodea, the people could no longer hear the voices of their gods, and even the oracles were unable to deliver their messages. This was due to the growing number of people who had stopped believing in the gods, causing their power to weaken. Iona was asked if she feared their vulnerability, but she remained silent. Fulgor, the god of lightning, passionately declared that they must eliminate the root cause and restore everything to its original state before the gods completely lose their powers. Iona questioned Fulgor's speech, stating that Ilaria hadn't done anything. Fulgor retorted, asking how she could be so sure when rumors were circulating in the world that Ilaria had conspired with the gents people, claiming she intended to revive the dragon. Fulgor urged the gods to take action before it was too late. Iona challenged his claim, arguing that it wasn't certain and dismissing his concerns. Tension rose as Fulgor and Iona glared at each other, obviously on the verge of a fight. Jupiter intervened, shouting for them to stop. He declared that they would leave the situation with Ilaria as it was. Jupiter's words caught everyone's attention and left them feeling confused. Iona felt a bit better and smiled slightly, happy that someone else agreed with her. Jupiter added that they still hadn't discovered why the world was dying, so it wasn't fair to say it was all Ilaria's fault. He suggested they let her do things her own way for now. One of the gods said they couldn't be sure what would happen since Ilaria was in the human world. Another god suggested that since Ilaria was the god of plants, her powers might be causing the world to wither. 
wondering if it would be better to capture her and investigate the matter. Well, how easy would it be to find her? It's definitely not going to be easy. Fulgore, filled with determination, called out to Jupiter, expressing his refusal to stand by and watch their realm fall apart. He couldn't just give up on Rita's glory without a fight. If Rita didn't take action, Fulgore declared that he would act on his own, his eyes burning with fury and resolve. Hmm, the god of lightning is so mean and arrogant, feel he's the chief architect of Valeria's misery and Rita, don't you think so too? Jupiter, feeling worn out, sat down and quietly apologized to Valeria. He admitted to himself that he couldn't do anything more to stop the other gods from acting on their own. Finally, Jupiter spoke up and announced that all gods were now permitted to explore the human world individually. Oops, this is bad. The gods were stunned by Jupiter's decision. Fulgore, however, smirked and warned that Alaria had better be prepared for his arrival. With a determined glare, he vowed to find her, no matter what it took. Oh my, this is scary. Exhausted, Alaria collapsed onto her bed and embraced her pillow. She sighed in relief, saying the storm had passed. Well, not all, baby girl. The storm is yet to come, Beep, with teary eyes, reached out to her. Alaria asked Beep if it was worried about her, admitting she missed it a lot. Suddenly, a voice from behind startled her. Chloe entered the room and asked Alaria who she was talking to. Alaria, feeling guilty, quickly turned and covered Beep with her hands. Chloe, suspicious, mentioned she had just arrived and wondered if Alaria was hiding something. Alaria insisted it was nothing and asked Chloe when she had come in. Chloe, unconvinced, noted that something seemed fishy and inquired if Ilaria was feeling better. Ilaria assured her she was fine, winking playfully. However, Ilaria couldn't help but feel confused. She had expected punishment and solitary confinement for a hundred years, but instead everyone seemed genuinely worried about her. She was surprised to find the workers waiting for her out of concern. Contrary to her expectations, everyone had been extremely worried about her, and even the workers had waited for her without leaving their work. Laughing, Alaria admitted she felt a little embarrassed by all the attention. Chloe chuckled, reminding her that it was only natural as everyone loved her. Alaria was the pride of the Derman family, and there was no one in the mansion who didn't feel indebted to her. Even the nobles treated her with gentleness and admiration. Alaria grinned slightly, murmuring that it felt strange to receive such adoration, she found it hard to believe that someone as really perfect as Rosalita had made such a significant choice on her own. Alaria couldn't help but wonder how she fell from the bottom. Though her curiosity burned, she knew there was no one she could ask for answers. Ouch! Too bad, right? Lying flat on the bed, Alaria exhaled sadly, telling herself to forget about it since there was no way to uncover the truth. Still, she acknowledged the love she had received in this new life, a love she never would have experienced had she stayed in Rita. Alaria knew that the love she received was meant for Rosalita, the original owner of the body she now possessed. Despite this, she yearned for affection and decided it didn't matter if the love was truly meant for her or not. Alaria whispered Rosalita's name, promising to live her life and thanking her for the love she had been given. She assured Rosalita that she didn't have to worry because Alaria would take care of everything. Exhausted, Alaria quickly fell into a deep sleep. Chloe chuckled softly upon seeing her lady doze off so quickly. Understanding that she had gone through a lot, Chloe covered her with a blanket and commented on how cute she looked while sleeping. With a genuine grin, Chloe murmured that her lady shouldn't worry because everyone adored her kind and lovely nature, assuring her that there was nothing for her to be concerned about. The following day, the secret that everyone had been hiding from Alaria was suddenly revealed. Alaria, full of excitement, burst in and surprised the maids by announcing that she had heard they had a present for her. Chloe gritted her teeth and tried to hide what she was holding behind her back. Chloe pretended to be clueless, acting as though she didn't know what Alaria was referring to. But Alaria saw right through it, grinning mischievously and declaring that she already knew everything because she had overheard their conversation. Just as expected, she's sharp to catch them, one of the maids tried to cover up by suggesting that perhaps it was a mistake and the delivery was meant for someone else. Alaria, however, wasn't having any of it. She quickly grabbed the box from the maid's hands and opened it, eager to see what was inside. The maid's expressions were tense, indicating Alaria was in for a shock. When she opened the box and saw the dress inside, she was shocked and asked what it was. 
She looked at the maids and repeated her question. Along with the dress, there was a letter. It read, My dear Rosalita, it's me, Philip. Did you receive my heartfelt gift? When I imagined you wearing this dress, I couldn't resist giving it to you. I really want to see you wear it, but I can't be there. You didn't even reply to my letter from the day before yesterday. Ilaria was disappointed. She couldn't believe it. She thought Rosalita was a saint, so how could she get involved with another man? She congratulated them sarcastically, saying that if their goal was to make her jealous, they had succeeded. Looking at the letter again, she felt completely confused and wondered if it was really meant for her. Chloe called out to her from behind, and Ilaria ordered her to explain everything about who Philip was and what exactly happened to her. All the maids stood at attention. Chloe hesitated but finally spoke up, saying, Philip is an artist supported by the Derman family. He has great talent, especially in oil painting. Even her lady loved his paintings, and that's how she met him. They started dating, but while they were together, something horrible happened. A large painting of her naked body was hung in the square. Alaria turned, dazed, and asked, Who played such a dirty joke? Don't tell me it's... Chloe replied, You guessed it right, because below the painting it was written, To my beloved woman. It was clearly a painting by Philip. Alaria asked, How did everyone know it was me in the painting? No one would have believed it was me, right? Chloe replied, saying that's what happened at first. But then Philip admitted it himself. OMG, what level of wickedness. He said it clearly to everyone that she's the one in the painting, Chloe informed Ilaria. Ilaria muttered to herself, pondering, why did he do it? Why would he try to bring down Rosalita? If he wanted money, he would have just blackmailed the Marquis directly. And if he wanted to break up with Rosalita, he must have known it was the wrong choice. Squeezing the paper tightly, Ilaria wondered about the essence of worrying about this. None of it matters to me, she sighed. Then, in an abusive tone, she demanded, Where is Philip? My father wouldn't have let this slide. Which prison is he in that he even sends me letters along with vulgar underwear? Chloe shocked Ilaria by revealing, He's not in prison. The Marquis couldn't imprison him because he ran away. The Marquis used every means to find him, but he vanished without a trace. Ilaria yelled in disbelief, demanding, What exactly does she mean? How does he send these letters to her then? Suddenly, she asked, does my father even know that he sends me letters? Chloe replied, no, he doesn't. At first, when he sent the letters, she ordered her to keep the whole thing hidden. The Marquis shouted, demanding to know why they hid the fact that Philip sent letters and gifts to Ilaria. He yelled that they should have told him all this from the beginning. The servants remained silent. Ilaria spoke up, admitting that she told them to keep it a secret. She begged her father not to be hard on the servants. Marquis Derman asked why she did so. Ilaria mumbled to herself, wondering why the real Rosalita actually kept it a secret. She concluded that she must have had her reasons. Sadly, she told her father that she didn't want to worry him, thinking to herself that Rosalita must have felt the same way. Looking at her father, she thought to herself that he must be very angry too. The Marquis called out her name, moving towards her with a warm expression. She thought to herself, a little cuddling won't hurt. He surprised her by engaging her in a tight hug saying his jelly has grown so much weight. Did he read her mind or something? She was shocked, wondering if he somehow read her mind. He gently patted her hair, leaving her thinking that this wasn't the kind of reaction she was expecting. After releasing her from the hug but still holding her shoulders, he mentioned that he heard about what happened in Selenica. He reassured her, saying it was okay and she didn't need to worry about it anymore. He promised that no one would dare say hurtful words to her, regardless of their family background, even if it was the royal family, he encouraged her not to let them off the hook. Do you understand, my jelly? The Marquis asked. Ilaria, feeling overwhelmed with emotion, grinned and said she wouldn't tolerate any of those insults anymore. Her father stared at her speechlessly, unable to hide his own emotions. Ilaria looked at him and mumbled to herself, that's right, I won't tolerate anyone's humiliation anymore either. After all she's endured, she knew it was time to start tackling things one by one without fail. Ilaria, sitting in front of a young man having lunch together, suddenly paused and asked what he had just said. The man, surprised, explained that he thought she might need his help in finding Philip's hideout. Ilaria asked what he meant by needing his help. He thought for a moment and then asked if he had spoken too abruptly. Well, it's about your fiancé, he said. You mentioned him before you lost your memories. Ilaria was shocked. 
Was there such a thing? She exclaimed. Her fiance? Well, let's find out. And this is where this part of the story ends. If you want the next part, please comment the name Rosalita. See you in the next one.